Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. Coming up on the program, should Illinois move to 100% renewable energy? We meet a Chicago native and former nominee for Supreme Court Justice who has a new PBS special. A sneak peek at tonight's State of the Union address and rookie Luis Robert is among the topics in our 2020 baseball preview. But first to Phil Ponce and how the Iowa caucuses have raised new concerns about election security. Phil. Paris, the long-awaited Iowa caucus ended in chaos and confusion last night. Citing inconsistencies with a new mobile app used for vote counting, Democrats delayed releasing results until just a few hours ago. Just how secure are the elections going into the 2020 presidential race? Joining us are Jim Allen, he's spokesperson for the Chicago Board of Elections, Anita Nikolic, research professor at the Illinois Institute of Technology, fellow at the Cyber Policy Initiative at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, and former program director for cybersecurity at the National Science Foundation. And joining us from Springfield is Matt Dietrich, public information officer for the Illinois State Board of Elections, and welcome all to Chicago tonight. Anita Nikolic, let me begin with you. What are your thoughts on what happened in Iowa? What happened in Iowa was the result of your typical releasing an application using technology without proper vetting. These people had a really interesting idea. They developed a really neat app. They did not develop it to think about the scale. And that, unfortunately, regardless of voting app or any other type of app, that's what's going to happen when you don't think about the proper um, development, testing, and, impl and implementation of an application. And when you say scale, what do you mean? The number of people who tried to use it? The number of people. So it's fine if you test in your office, if you emulate what it's going to be like. But when you test it out with you know, hundreds and thousands of people, that's a whole incredibly different scale. And most of these applications don't think about that scale. Matt Dietrich does what happened in Iowa concern, be of concern to people here in Illinois. Well, it shouldn't be a concern to people in Illinois in one sense, because in Illinois, no election authority could use a third party piece of software or app or could ever send official results on a, over a cell phone. Um, that's all in statute. And we have a rigorous pre-testing system for all of our voting precincts and all of our local election authorities. But the one thing that should concern Illinois voters is what happened once this problem developed in Iowa and what's happened since, and that is what's gone on on social media where speculation was rampant and any type of, you know, even a small glitch is amplified now into rumors about hacking. Of course, in Illinois, we're very sensitive to that because the State Board of Elections had a hacking episode that was attributed to Russia in 2016. And uh, so let, let me interrupt you, that, uh, Matt, I'm, I, I apologize, but let me interrupt you. Uh, and remind us very quickly what happened in 2016. Well, in 2016, an intruder broke into the statewide voter registration database that we maintain. Now, as it turned out, that didn't have any consequence on the 2016 election. We notified about 76,000 voters that their data may have been viewed, and we alerted them to call the attorney general's office should anything suspicious happen with their personal information. We never heard from anyone about that, but that set us onto the path that we're on now where we are very vigilant regarding cy cyber security. And what we are focused on now in 2020 is the Illinois Cyber Navigator Program, which is a program that we developed in 2018 using roughly $14 million in combined federal and state funding. And that is a program that sends cyber navigators, these are technicians who are assigned to local election authorities, county clerks throughout Illinois, and they're conducting risk assessments on cybersecurity, and we are then able to help with grant funding to pay for that. We don't want any local election authority to be the weak link in the Illinois election infrastructure that gets picked on the way we did in 2016. Jim Allen, tell us about how the Illinois Cyber Navigator Program is uh, being implemented in Chicago. How does it work? Well, we have our own cybersecurity expert, someone who used to be working with the Federal Reserve Bank, who we brought on and we work with Cook County and Chicago shares that position. But 
what the Cyber Navigator program does is it leverages financing from the federal government through the state. And before you get any financing, you have to agree to participate and have uh, participate in tabletop exercises, review your databases, review your systems, review your networks to make sure that everything is, is as locked down and secure as possible. Anita Nikolic, uh, this new program, it's being implemented in all the state's 102 counties. How do you assess uh, its, uh, its efficacy in uh, shutting down possible breaches? So Illinois by far has the, probably the best security in terms of state voting security. The, the, the voter registration databases in all the states, that is clearly the most vulnerable point. Uh, it, it's generally not the election machines, it's a voter registration database. In Illinois, you assess an efficacy by auditing. There's periodic audits. They do, I think, daily audits. They do backups of this database. They make sure the information is correct. And that's the way by being really vigilant and constantly looking to make sure there's a provenance that the data is accurate. It's not just there. But by looking at the provenance, the origin, where it came from, and validating this, you can tell that, that it's, it has integrity. Matt Dietrich, uh, an audit uh, recently released by the Illinois Office of the Auditor General criticizes the Illinois State Board of Elections for not doing enough to reduce the risk of a hack and for not having enough cybersecurity training. What's your reaction to that audit? Well, we don't dispute the findings of the audit, and I think we've got comments within the report itself. But if you read carefully, you'll see that, that the criticism of, of our agency pertains really to our documentation of cybersecurity measures, not to the security itself. And believe me, there's no agency in state government that has been more attentive to cybersecurity than we have, especially in light of what happened with Russia in 2016. Uh, Jim Allen, is there a, a particular part of the city's election system that is a potential point of weakness? Uh, probably not the best question to, 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 uh, to ask or to answer, but uh, what, is, what are the kinds of things that keep you up at night? Well, the biggest, the biggest concerns for any jurisdiction are to make sure that you have fallback positions for everything so that if the poll books go down, you need to have paper poll books so you can still check in voters and issue ballots. You need to have paper ballots, and we've had that for the, uh, since the switch over from uh, the punch cards in 2005. So we have a paper ballot and a hard record to go back, and we've endured and survived recounts, and all of our elections that have been uh, closely contested uh, have come out on the right side. So we feel uh, pretty confident that we've got uh, a good system in place. And the biggest uh, item to make sure is that you have a chain of custody, a clear chain of custody from, and, and security from the warehouse to the polling places and then to the receiving stations at night after the polls close and then ultimately back to the election authority itself. Matt, uh, my understanding is that the way the, the different election systems are set up in the state, the various election systems, that uh, their, their diversity, in a sense, is a strength. Uh, would you explain that? Well, in having a decentralized election system like we have in Illinois, you spread the risk that you know one cyber attack, for example, couldn't wipe out the entire voting record for the state. Even when our database was hacked, it had no effect on the election and it wouldn't have had an effect if, even if they had wiped the whole thing out because each election authority in Illinois, that's 102 counties and six municipal boards of election, maintains its own voter registration record and they actually conduct the elections. Illinois has what is referred to as a bottom-up system in which the local election authorities conduct the elections, they do the registrations, we administer the elections. It's, Illinois is kind of a microcosm of what we have at the federal level where we have a decentralized system where states uh, choose their own election systems. So it sounds like there is no common point of entry. Uh, Anita Nikolic, uh, in recent months, senior intelligence officials are saying that there is no question but that foreign governments are going to try to hack this year's presidential election. Is that still the conventional wisdom? It is, and more than likely it's not going to be through voting machines and voter registration databases. More than likely it's going to be using social media. It's going to be by causing chaos and disrupting the democratic process, by polarizing people, by making people's opinions even more distinct from each other. That's more than likely 
They have convinced people to take a certain position, to not change it, uh, even going so far as to say that the, the, uh, um, the polling places are incorrect, uh, pointing people to the wrong place. That's clearly how they're going to maintain success in this next election if, in, for adversarial reasons. So real quickly, are you saying that the election system is non-hackable in a way that can affect the results? The election system is always hackable. But I think the greater concern is not the technology, it's the people. That's a, that's a weakness in any security system. And this one in particular, it's convincing people to not go to polls. That, that's actually a bigger weakness. Jim Allen, Anita Nik uh, Nikolic, and Matt Dietrich in Springfield, thank you all for joining us. We very much appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you, Phil. And we are back with more right after this. <laughs> It's a familiar refrain in Illinois. A former state legislator is fighting a corruption charge. Amanda Vinicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Paris, Luis Arroyo resigned as a state representative late last year after he was charged with bribing another lawmaker. But this afternoon in federal court, he pleaded not guilty. Arroyo, a Chicago Democrat, also waived his right to an indictment by a grand jury, a sign in the future he may be inclined to cooperate with the government and change his plea. Arroyo and his attorney left the courthouse without comment. Meanwhile, Illinois House Republican leader Jim Durkin this evening filing a petition to unseat Arroyo's successor. Local Democrats chose People's Gas Executive Eva Dina Delgado to replace Arroyo in the House. Arroyo wasn't physically there then, but a proxy used his votes to help Delgado win. Durkin says that taints Delgado's appointment. It could be a while before indicted Chicago Alderman Ed Burke's trial begins. Burke was charged in a criminal complaint last January on 14 counts, including attempted extortion and racketeering. He's pleaded not guilty. Now attorneys are dealing with hefty volumes of records. A trial date's not set, but word from a brief status hearing is that the federal judge in the case blocked off his schedule for May of 2021. Privacy advocates who say facial recognition surveillance is biased and inaccurate want it banned in Chicago. The quiet acquisition of facial recognition technology has been deployed by the city uh, and has threatened the civil rights and due process and civil liberties of everyone in our city. Myself. Mayor Lori Lightfoot created a working group to review how Chicago uses the technology. In a statement, her office says it's been repeatedly assured that the police and CPD vendors do not use live facial recognition software, which identifies people in real time. Following an incident or crime, the CPD says it speeds its searches with a facial matching tool that sorts mugshots and public source information. Already, there are long lines for real IDs at many Illinois Secretary of State outposts. Now, a small portion of Secretary of State workers are threatening to strike. Some unionized employees are at odds with Secretary Jesse White over their next contract. Working hard, you know, working under less than ideal conditions, and we just want to be uh, compensated uh, for what we're doing. A Secretary of State spokesman says White respects the employees but needs to be careful with taxpayer money. A strike could occur if a deal is not reached at the next bargaining session set for next Friday. It won't make much of a dent in Illinois' budget, but the state brought in $240 million as delinquent taxpayers made good on their debts. A tax amnesty program let taxpayers settle up without having to pay a penalty. As for the weather, cloudy and blustery tonight with a low around 26. Tomorrow, a chance of snow later in the afternoon. Otherwise, cloudy and windy with a high near 32 degrees. Now, Paris, back to you.
All right, thanks, Amanda. Still to come on Chicago tonight, a look at how Illinois might transition to 100% renewable energy. Baseball's almost here. We take a swing at the Sox and Cubs chances in 2020 with broadcasters Jason Benetti and Len Casper. He photographed all 60 national parks, then he came to visit the newest park, the Indiana Dunes. Judge Douglas Ginsburg gives America a civics lesson with a new PBS series on the Constitution. And will President Trump talk about the impeachment trial during his State of the Union address? But first, some of today's top business headlines. Here's Crane Chicago business editor, Ann Dwyer. Thank you, Paris. Not a single home in the Chicago area sold for $4 million or more in January. It's another piece of evidence that the top of the real estate market has sagged dramatically. So says Crane's reporter Dennis Rodkin, who just completed a tally of 2019 home sales and finds that January was the first month in at least five years where there were no Chicago area home sales priced in that range. The January 2020 pause follows a big drop in sales at $4 million and up in 2019. There were 52 sales during the year in that range, down from 73 in 2018. Meanwhile, commercial real estate close to the Ogilvy Transportation Center in the West Loop continues to be red hot. Cranes reports today that a longtime office landlord at 150 North Clinton Street plans a major renovation as well as a 100,000 square foot addition to be constructed on a vacant lot next door. At the same time, a real estate venture controlled by Chicago billionaire Penny Pritzker is looking to cash out of a neighboring building at 564 West Randolph Street. Sources say the seven-story brick and timber building, which underwent a significant renovation in 2011, could fetch more than $28 million. And finally, an ambitious plan to spark revitalization in the East Garfield Park neighborhood has received a pledge of $100 million. The developer plans to buy a row of 13 vacant lots on the 2700 block of West Madison Street early next month. The plan includes 114 apartments, a tech incubator, a performing arts venue, and retail spaces. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann Dwyer. Back to you, Paris. Thanks, Ann. Governor J.B. Pritzker and Illinois lawmakers are signaling they could be ready to pass legislation that eventually moves the state to 100% renewable energy. Urgent action is needed. But let me be clear. The old ways of negotiating energy legislation are over. It's time to put consumers and climate first. I am not going to sign an energy bill written by the utility companies. But we know less about what that legislation could look like. One proposal is called the Clean Energy Jobs Act, or CEJA. Supporters say it not only would have obvious environmental benefits, but boost the state's economy. Others have raised concerns about the legislation, saying it could mean higher costs for business. So here to discuss the legislation are Jennifer Walling, Executive Director of the Illinois Environmental Council, which is supporting CEJA, and Katie Stonewater, Executive Director of the Energy Council of the Illinois Chamber of Commerce, which has raised some of those concerns about the legislation. Welcome both of you to Chicago tonight. And before we get to questions, I just wanna quickly outline what's in this proposal. So it calls for Illinois to be off fossil fuels by 2030 and off of fossil fuels and nuclear power by 2050. And it also incentivizes electrification of the transportation sector, Read more electric cars and trucks. So Jen Walling, how does this legislation accomplish those goals? Well, uh, as part of the, uh, the Illinois Environmental Council, we're part of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition, um, which we held over 100 listening sessions, community conversations all over the state of Illinois. And from those uh, conversations, we drafted the Community Ener uh, Clean Energy Jobs Act. Um, the Clean Energy Jobs Act is written by those communities. So uh, for the different portions of the bill that was laid out, the Clean Energy Jobs Act, um, we look at uh, ramping up our renewable portfolio standards to get to 100% renewable energy by 2050, actually planning for decarbonization of the electricity sector. Right now, coal plants can offer 30 days notice and close. And, and to be clear, the, you're talking about production of electricity in Illinois, so 100% renewable energy production. We're, uh, of what we procure within the state for our own usage, I see, yes. I see. Okay, and Katie Stonewater, uh, you've raised some concerns about this legislation. Tell us what they are. 
Yeah, um, it has primarily to do with just the cost of the legislation. CEJA significantly expands ratepayer support uh, for a variety of programs um, without budgets or cost caps, um, calling for mandates like decarbonizing the electricity sector by 2030, and asking Illinois to operate its own capacity market. All of those things... We're going to have to get into what exactly that means, but go on. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, but all of those things combined are just very concerning to us because of the cost. Um, you know, look, Illinois has to address the unfair uh, costs on energy users, large energy users, industrial users um, around the state who end up paying the brunt of uh, new energy programs and, and changes because those uh, programs are supported by ratepayer subsidies. And while residential users um, often are protected by cost caps, uh, larger users are often not. Um, so again, you know, we need to make sure that as we have conversations about the future of energy policy in Illinois, we do seek good policies that, um, that grow Illinois' economy, um, but we just make sure that we do it in a way that business, rate, business rate pairs are not burdened. All right, so let's tackle one of those concerns, Jen Walling. So Katie's saying that residential customers will be protected from big rate hikes as a result mm -hmm. of this, but not larger business customers. Is that the way you read it? Well, let's talk first about the cost of climate change to our state, right? And where climate change is already affecting Illinois, we've seen $3 billion um, in flooding damage between 2000 and 2019. The majority of the corn crop was not in the ground um, as of June 1st. Uh, the lake levels are rising um, and municipalities are seeing infrastructure costs rising from climate change. So the cost of doing nothing is the most expensive option. Um, and that also has to do with the FERC order, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, Trump administration order um, that is a fossil fuel bailout that I is about the capacity. This was a recent ruling yes. handed down by that federal agency. Mm -hmm. um, Katie, you know, three years ago, uh, Exelon came to the General Assembly asking that ratepayers bail out its struggling nuclear power plants. It got what it wished. It's doing it again, and this bill would uh, continue the operation of those nuclear power plants. Is that a concern for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, when we don't want to see any legislation that could constrain uh, the market. Um, you know, when when the Future Energy Jobs Act passed, it did. Um, it did allow for the, pro the zero emission credit program that had a significant impact on a lot of our users. You know, I, I will use the example that one of our users saw a one million um, rate increase on, in their electricity bills per year. Percent? Uh, no, $1 million. $1 million? Yes. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. So that's a huge impact. And for them, particularly for the zero emission credits, they don't see any positive, they don't see any benefit from that program. So when we do look at, at um, you know, the CJA bill, uh, the capacity market reforms that are included in that, we don't see that, that is a, that's a net benefit for users. All right. State. So what are the concerns that this bill offers another bailout to ComEd or Exelon's, uh, I should say, the parent company, uh, that company's nuclear power plants? Um, we don't think that this is a bill that is a bailout at all. In fact, as we talked about, this is a bill that guarantees a 5% reduction in the electricity generation portion of the bills. Not doing something is a bailout on the companies that the chamber represents. The Illinois Chamber has um, continued its legacy of representing the interests of large fossil fuel generators who stand to make millions of dollars if we don't pass the Clean Energy Jobs Act from their contributions to climate change. Okay, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. We also represent the interest of solar and wind companies, battery storage companies. You know, my energy council uh, represents pretty much everybody who makes moves and uses energy. Um, so we, we do, um, you know, we do represent pretty much everybody in the energy industry. Um, but then also there's a concern with CJA that, um, you know, it, it may not include the perspectives of those folks who, who develop and finance some of these programs. So we just want to make sure that any en energy policy that um, is at the table um, includes every perspective. Jen Wong, what's the message for people that work in the coal industry, which is more robust downstate than it is around here, saying, well, you know, we depend on this industry for our jobs and our livelihood? Well, I mean, I think if you're looking at this and you're an advocate for business in the state, um, especially a diverse and thriving business environment, this is a bill that's supposed to bring in $39 billion in new private investment. There are already 123,000 people working in clean energy jobs in Illinois, but our bill is actually really important for the people who are working in the coal industry in Illinois. We lost a quarter of our capacity in coal plants in Illinois last year. 
Um, and all of those were closures that had 30 or 60 days. There were coal plant workers that didn't have a job before Christmas last year. And our bill contemplates a pathway to which we close those facilities, but we have a plan for closure. And that plan also supports those local communities where the coal plants would be located, which if we do nothing right now, um, that's not the case. And those folks just lose their jobs. There's no retraining. There's no programs to the community. Kate, Katie Sonja, do you, do you uh, support that kind of approach to slowly sort of uh, wean this industry out of Illinois and help train those folks for these new jobs? I mean, we, we you know, prefer that com the competitive marketplace um, has, takes a priority in uh, conversations for um, any, you know, policies that move forward. But, um, you know, finding ways to support these types, these communities when any plant um, closes, whether it's a manufacturing plant or a coal or gas plant or anything, um, you know, we do, we do think it's important to find ways to be able to support these communities in those transitions. And you quickly ask, if you've been paying attention to news, you know that ComEd is likely the subject of an enormous uh, federal investigation with respect to its lobbying efforts in Springfield. Jen Walling, how does that affect this process in trying to pass this bill? Well, we agree with what the governor brought up in the State of the State address. Um, he brought up that he will not sign a bill written by the big utilities, <clears throat> and that's great. Those companies have driven the legislative process in Illinois for decades, and we've seen what the result is. The result has been um, climate change. It's been uh, toxic messes in our communities. Um, it's been higher uh, electric bills for consumers. Um, and that's no longer the case. Uh, the bill that we've put forward hasn't been built by ComEd or Exxon. In fact, they oppose the Clean Energy Jobs Act. Um, it's been this community-driven process. So I think that um, we're looking forward to working with the governor and others um, to put a bill together that not only tackles climate change, but tackles the accountability and ethics issues by ra being raised by these very serious cases right now. All right, Jennifer Walling, Katie Stonewater, we have to leave it there. Very difficult conversation, but we will be following this debate in the next few months. And we're back to preview the baseball season right after this. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. We may have about six inches of snow in the forecast, but guess what? Spring is still in the air. That's because we are now exactly one week away from that magical date when pitchers and catchers report to spring training. So we thought it would be fun to hear from the two men who describe all the action on the Sox and Cubs television broadcasts all summer long, the voices of summer. And they are Jason Benetti, who is about to begin his fifth year calling White Sox games, and Len Casper, who is starting his 16th season on Cubs broadcast this year. Gentlemen, welcome both of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Paris. Uh, are we talking about the coal We're, industry? Yeah, or I want to get your take on clean oh, energy. Yeah, uh, well, uh, <laughs> we need a lot of energy with the six uh, inches of snow coming tomorrow. We, but we it is do. nice to talk uh, baseball. I know the, the White Sox had their convention the weekend after the Cubs. And it always feels like the worst part of winter is right around that time. So it's, it's a good time to talk baseball. Although it hasn't been the worst winter so far. <laughs> no, no. If, I just want to let people know this being election season that Len and I decided not to run attack ads against one another <laughs> this year. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's worth, it's a truce. It's worth yes. uh, describing. We are all very relieved uh, yeah. about that. Jason Benetti, a lot of buzz around this offseason for the White Sox, um, supplementing this growing core with some uh, choice free agents. Are the Sox primed? Prime to contend for the postseason right now. I, I think so, especially considering the division that the Sox are in right now. Minnesota obviously was the class of the division last year. Cleveland still has all the pitching they've created. Detroit and Kansas City are not going to be very good this year, uh, we expect. So uh, for me, with the Sox young core and those guys you're adding, and Carnacion, Grandal, et cetera, et cetera, it seems like the division is in the right place for the Sox to have a window that opens for a while starting this year. All right, say. and Len Casper, it seems like the news with the Cubs was that they were really quiet this offseason. Um, why was that, do you believe? I think a lot of reasons. I think the Chris Bryant 
uh, grievance, which uh, is now finally resolved. Uh, the, the, the Cubs essentially won. I don't know if anybody really won, but they'll have uh, Chris for two more years under contract. So I think they had to wait uh, for that to happen. Remember, they, they, they signed Craig Kimbrell in June. I think that might, have, that, that might have been a move they would have made this offseason. So even though they got kind of half a season out of him, uh, I would consider that kind of one of those moves. Um, actually, the most money they spent was in the front office. Uh, they kind of revamped. Uh, their uh, research and development, uh, their scouting department, um, really kind of taking a hard look at, okay, we've had success here for the last five years or so. Let's make sure that we're not falling behind some of the other really smart organizations in baseball. So do you think some of the fan criticism that the Ricketts just aren't spending enough uh, this offseason, is that fair? Well, the Cubs have been basically in the top three, I think, uh, in payroll here the last few years. And uh, I, I, I use the word budget. I think when you talk about families, they understand what a budget means. <laughs> and just every once in a while you don't go, let's just go double it this, this year for whatever reason. So I, all organizations, and I know Jason can speak to the White Sox, they budget years in advance. There is a little room to kind of play on the margins, but for the most part, I think you try to stay where you want to, and the luxury tax is, is not unimportant. Jason Benetti, the White Sox did open their wallets uh, for Luis Robert, this rookie sensation, $100 million, even though he has yet to face a pitch in the major leagues. Is, is this kind of a gamble? First of all, I'm sad the Caspers aren't going on vacation because Len won't double the budget <laughs> with the whole family discussion there. Uh, I, I, for Luis Robert, we have heard so much about his athleticism. And as you watch video, the first guy that struck me was uh, Terrell Owens. I mean, you see that ball right there. Like, you have to spot shadow out of the picture to show where the home run was. Terrell went. Owens, a football player? Yeah, by, by the way he runs. How oh, graceful okay. he is in the outfield and the long strides, that's the first person I thought of, it, he reminded me of in terms of athleticism. So yeah, there'll be growing pains like we saw with Eloy Jimenez last year, and there's another one of those ridiculous spot shadows. But like uh, for the way he hits the ball and, and what he can provide in terms of tools, I, th I think he belongs in the majors. Len Casper, um, I mean, the big move in the offseason was hiring uh, Grandpa Rossi, David Ross, the former catcher, as, as a manager. How is he different from Joe Madden? It's a great question. I, I think it remains to be seen what kind of a manager uh, he will be. Uh, I, I know him pretty well. I knew him well as a player. I think the big question is, will he be Grandpa Rossi? No. <laughs> you, that term is like, that's way in the past. Uh, He's he, banning that in the clubhouse Well, <laughs> I, I think fans view him as the guy who won Dances with the Stars, all that right, stuff. Right. But, but, but if you're a teammate of David Ross, you know that he is not afraid to get in your face if there's something you did on the field that he didn't like. Mm. Uh, and I think that fundamentally the relationship you have as a teammate that changes when it becomes manager player mm -hmm. it just does you have to go to the office uh, to talk to him and i don't think he'll have any problem disciplining guys he's very upbeat but that also gives him a lot of room to be critical and i think vocally critical maybe even in the media too at times mm. and jason Benetti, um you know talking about some of these free agent acquisitions uh, one of them was catcher yasmani grandal uh they already have a pretty good catcher in james mccann so why uh, why was this Grandall signing uh, uh, necessary? Yeah, when when you hear from Rick Hahn about it at SoxFest, as we did, he said, "Give me all, you know, basically, give me all the catchers I can have. <laughs> Good catchers are very hard to come by, especially all stars like Yasmani Grandall and." James McCann upped the level of preparation in the clubhouse last year by catchers for pitchers. Yasmani Grandal is going to take it to an even further level based on what we've heard from him. He was a draw for Dallas Keuchel in free mm, agency. Uh, Keuchel said, hey, you got Yaz. Let's, let's think about coming here. So he's into analytics. He loves uh, more futuristic information, if you want to call it that, and, and we'll see some of that. Kind of the way that David Ross was a draw for John Lester years ago. He also walks a lot. I think that'll help this offense a lot, don't you? Uh, this this is this is White Sox talk, please. <laughs> uh, I, I no, I, I I said to myself, I am going to jump into yeah. the White Sox plus. And I, I am a former uh, broadcast partner of David Ross, so I I could okay. speak about your manager. Well, go too, ahead. But I decided not. And to Steve Stone has been in both Cubs and Sox booths. Um, all right, so so Len, you mentioned Chris Bryant and the arbitration ruling. Essentially, it means he can't declare free agency until after 2021. How is his relationship with the organization after this? Look, it's business. Uh, you know, I'm sure um, there'll be some hurt feelings for a couple of days uh, over what happened. Uh, the union today said we disagree with the decision, even though we have to abide by it. I, I think the solution to the problem probably comes in the next collective bargaining agreement. Uh, I understand the players' plight. Uh, a lot of young players uh, probably don't get paid what they might deserve. 
commensurate to some other sports. But baseball's always been about experience. And for a long time, the union's been more about the veteran player, the guy going into free agency, as opposed to the rookie player. Maybe that'll start to change. And, and obviously, he, he has more trade value if his contract isn't up this year. Do you really think the Cubs are interested in trading him? I don't think they're interested in trading him, but I do think if there is a paradigm shift to be made where they they're just do something and to kind of change the, the, the feel, you can't just trade anybody. So that's why you're hearing Chris Bryant, while you're hearing uh, Wilson Contreras. If you're going to get a lot in return, you might have to give up something. But at this late stage, I think it's more 60-40 probably that Chris will be a Cub mm -hmm. uh, this 60 year. 60-40. Yeah, I yeah. think it's more than 50% at this hmm. point. And Jason Benetti mentioned Yasmani Grandal was a key piece in getting Dallas Keuchel, the pitcher from Houston. Um, how? What do you expect out of him this year? What what you get out of him is basically the same thing every year with the exception of one jump on the Cy Young uh, side a couple years ago. He's a ground ball pitcher in an era that doesn't exactly create ground ball pitchers. So he's something of an anomaly. But in terms of what he can provide and understanding to young pitchers, when James Shields was with the Sox, he was kind of teaching the 301 class when the guys were basically only ready for 101. Keuchel now comes at a time when Giolito has advanced some. You've got Michael Kopech, who's got an advanced understanding of pitching as well. Reynaldo Lopez, you hope, progresses. So I think Keuchel can transmit some information to guys who are more ready now than when they last had a veteran like him. And, and GM Rick Hahn was here saying, I mean, he just has that, that winning uh, experience, and that means something in the clubhouse. Uh, Len Casper, I want to talk business a little bit. Yeah, the Ricketts family got some blowback for this new marquee network uh, that's going to broadcast all the Cubs games. What, what should fans expect from this network? It, it's interesting. Uh, I, I'm, I'm excited, too, because, uh, you know, we haven't hit the air yet. Uh, the first day will be February 22nd when the, the Cubs play the Oakland A's, and that'll kick off the network. It'll be 24-7 uh, Cubs baseball. Uh, I'm already uh, going to be voicing some, some documentary things that'll happen. So I, I think uh, ultimately Cub fans will be very excited about it. But I also understand 72 years on WGN, uh, that legacy matters and change is hard. So it's just, you know, you got to get used to finding a new channel on your cable system and uh, it'll happen. And Assuming we'll they get, strike a deal with Comcast. We'll get going here uh, in a few weeks, yeah. Jason Benny, you both are very active on Twitter. Um, I, I, not as active as Steve Stone, who seems to respond to everybody on Twitter. I think he's tweeting right now. I think actually, he is. I Hopefully assume. he's tweeting this appearance. What's your approach to social media? Uh, it's a place where you can learn a lot of interesting things about the world, and if you throw a question out that has answers that are of a variety, you get a whole lot of responses from people. I, I just like seeing people's opinions on stuff that's a little less than serious, mm. because if you <laughs> do serious stuff on Twitter, get your Kevlar out. <laughs> Guys, I have to leave it there. Jason Benetti, Len Casper, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, it's a pleasure to be we with you. We will be listening and watching over the next several months. Well, until last year, the closest national park to Chicago was a five-hour drive, Cuyahoga Valley in Ohio. But in February 2019, the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore became America's 61st national park. Within days, a celebrated photographer came to the dunes to capture its winter beauty and complete his portfolio. Jay Shevsky was there. Here's another look. The Indiana Dunes includes 15,000 acres of wetlands, prairie, rivers, forests, and of course, sand dunes. And when the dunes became America's 61st national park in February, this man booked a flight. His name is Q.T. Luong. I was born in Paris, France, and then I, I came here to the U.S. a quarter century ago. And uh, that year, I, I began my project to photograph all the U.S. national parks. Plenty of fine photographers have captured the wonders of the national parks. But Q.T. Luong is the only one who has photographed every national park with a large format camera. I was the first to, to photograph all the 58 national parks, and then all the 59, all the 60s, and so I wanted to, to try to, 
tu kiffes ça, ça te recorde. QT Luang is a scientist. He began to visit the national parks when he came to the University of California at Berkeley. He brought a standard 35 millimeter camera, but wasn't satisfied with the results. Then he saw the spectacular and iconic photos of Ansel Adams. The most beautiful prints I'd ever seen. And so I saw it was time to try to photograph with the same cameras as the masters. The first time I took um, a picture with that camera, when I came home, I looked at the transparency and I could see more details in the transparency that I could see at the scene. If I made a picture with this camera, I can really place the viewer as a scene because then he will be able to see as much as I saw, explore the scene for, for himself. Luang doesn't just visit the easy national park views, he must often travel for days. To get these shots of the Aragech peaks in gates of the Arctic National Park required two commercial flights, a mail plane, and then a float plane. And from there, we, we, we backpack for a couple of days to, to, to get to the base of the peak. The Indiana Dunes best views are quite accessible, and Luang says he was struck by the ecological diversity. You see forests and you see wetlands and you have the dunes and you have the coast, so, so it's quite a bit going on in, in such a small park. Each large format photo costs $10 for film and processing. So these days, QT Luang mostly uses a digital camera, which he says can now approach the level of detail that drew him to large format photography a quarter century ago. But if a 60-second national park is created, QT Luang will be there with the camera he has now carried to 61 of them. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shevsky. And in fact, a 60-second national park was created in December. The White Sands National Monument in southern New Mexico was designated a national park, and QT Long was there to take these photos. There is, by the way, a beautiful coffee table book of QT Long's photos. It's called Treasured Lands, a Photographic Odyssey Through America's National Parks. And you can find out more and see a slideshow on our website. Well, our next guest is a Chicago native who has served on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit for more than three decades since being appointed by President Ronald Reagan in 1986. He was also nominated for the U.S. Supreme Court by President Reagan, but withdrew his name from consideration after admitting to earlier smoking marijuana. Now he can add PBS host to his accomplished resume. Here's a clip from his new series on the Constitution called A More or Less Perfect Union. got rid of these faraway governments, why would we want to create another one of our own? An unprecedented idea, never tried before. What are you hoping to come out of this convention with? The unified country, sir. U.S. history is basically a struggle of citizens retaining their liberty. This is the First Amendment that protects your right to stand here. And joining us now is Judge Douglas Ginsburg, who still serves as a senior judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, also served seven years as chief judge from 2001 to 2008. And I should mention, you are a Chicago native, proud graduate of Latin School and U of C Law. So welcome back home. It's great to be back home, I must say. <laughs> All right, so what made you want to do this PBS series on the Constitution at this point? Well, there's been a, such a falling off in civics education in the United States in the last few decades that young people today, and many older people as well, are really quite uninformed about the Constitution, about their rights, about the ways in which their rights are always under threat. You just saw a clip from, uh, I think that was Berkeley Univers Public University. Uh, First Amendment applies, it's a public institution, and uh, they have young people there shouting down, trying to prevent a speaker from being heard. 
something that f is in the teeth of the First Amendment. I mean, if they don't understand that the speaker has as much right to speak as they have to, to counter that speech. So, so it's things like this that compelled you to, to do a series to focus on this. And I found out that civics education has really been in withdrawal in the last 30 years or 25 years. So this program is for the TV audience initially, public television, but it will be broken up into small units and supplied to 170,000 teachers who have signed up to get this material. They get a little piece every week and some critical thinking questions for the discussion in the class. And that will go on year after year, as long as these are pertinent issues. Now, so we mentioned uh, way back in your history, you were nominated by President Reagan to the Supreme Court. You later withdrew uh, because you admitted to having smoked some marijuana. Could you just give us a, 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 an idea of what it was like to be under that kind of scrutiny? Oh, under the news media scrutiny? Yeah, sure. <laughs> From people like yourself? Um, well, it was, uh, it was only a week and it was not very uh, comfortable, to say the least. But uh, I terminated that quickly and got back to work. I've, been, I've heard 3,000 cases on the Court of Appeals. It's been a great career since then. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was time to do something uh, different, but equally for the benefit of the public. And, you know, you are a staunch advocate for um, the judicial philosophy known as originalism. It was uh, practiced by late Justice Scalia. Can you just tell us what originalism entails in your Sure, mind? it's very simple. It's the simplest idea imaginable, that the words of the Constitution should be understood to mean what they meant to the people who wrote them and the people who ratified the Constitution in all of the states. It was written by lawyers, very carefully worked out, but in language that the citizenry was supposed to be able and should be able to understand. And everyone's got an opinion about the Constitution, but not many people have read it. And it doesn't take very long. You couldn't understand your, your mortgage or the deed to your house without a lawyer. But the Constitution was meant for citizens to understand it. I take it you carry it around in your coat pocket with you everywhere you go. I try to, yeah. So the you know, alternative philosophy practiced by some of the more liberal members is yeah. this idea of a living Constitution. And, and their argument right. is there were things the framers could not have anticipated. Why do you oppose that so the, idea? The, the arc of the show over the three hours is about that debate. Of course, it's not lectures or talking heads. It's people who've been involved in real life situations. Um, the alternative to originalism is that the Supreme Court can alter the Constitution, as you say, thinking they're updating it for new situations, uh, without the democratic participation of the public. There is a process for amending the Constitution. It was written into the original document. It's onerous, it's difficult, it's not meant to be easy. But the Supreme Court has, over the years, snipped some clauses out, put some words in, and radically changed the document. And if I can give you a very simple example, sure. the, the federal government is authorized through the Congress to regulate interstate commerce, the mov movement of goods from one state to another. And in the late 1930s and 1942 in particular, the court said, well, it can really just be things affecting commerce. And so most of what we have as this big administrative government in Washington is based on the idea that it can regulate things that do not cross state lines. And you've also said in interviews that uh, the legislative branch has kind of abdicated its role in this sort of tri-branch uh, of government and right. checks and balances. Right. So, what do you mean by that? Well, the framers' concept was, and the structure of the in the Constitution was, three separate branches, the legislature to make laws, the, uh, uh, the executive, the president, and the executive branch to enforce the law, and the judiciary to resolve disputes over the law. And what the Congress did, st starting in the 20s in great numbers and greatly since then, is create executive agencies, delegated their lawmaking power to these agencies, and told the agencies, you can act as the lawmaker by passing the regulations that have the force of law. You can enforce those act as the executive, and then you can be the judge of whether someone violated your regulation. So we have 18 times more regulations in a year than we have laws passed by the Congress. So lawma lawmakers aren't really passing laws, but uh, politically it kind of works to their advantage, you've argued. Well, that's why they do it. Sure, who wants to be for clean air? Oh, I do, I do. Let's vote for clean air. But the actual burden that of regulating clean air 
achieving clean air falls on administrative agencies. They then come up with regulations that burden the public, so some individuals and companies, and those people write to their congressman, and the congressman says, oh, that's terrible. I'll write a letter to the Environmental Protection Agency or the Army Corps of Engineers, which, of course, does no, no good. So they get the credit for passing an aspirational law, but not the responsibility of voting for or against the things that actually matter. Of having signed pen to paper on that law. Okay, Judge Ginsburg, we have to leave it there. So much to talk about. Welcome back home, and, and we look forward to your series. Thank you, Paris. PBS and uh, this station. WTTW. Uh, October, uh, this station next Sunday, October 16th, two Sundays from now. All right. And Judge Ginsburg will be discussing and showing clips from a more or less perfect union tomorrow evening at the University of Chicago. The three episodes, as Mr. Ginsburg just mentioned, will begin airing WTTW February 16th. And Amanda is back with a preview of the State of the Union in just a moment, so please stick around. Don't ever miss Chicago tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. Amid an impeachment trial, President Donald Trump will address the country tonight in his third State of the Union address. The only other time a president delivered a State of the Union address during an impeachment trial was President Bill Clinton in 1999. However, Trump seems to want to focus on what he sees as his achievements, calling the theme of this year's speech the Great American Comeback. Joining us to break down what we may hear tonight is Zizi Papakarisi, a professor of communication and political science at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And thank you so much for being here. Thank what? you for good evening. <laughs> oh, good. So what topics should we expect to hear Trump talk about coming up? Uh, well, it's his last uh, speech uh, before the president and the country launch into full election mode. So I think it's quite likely that we'll see him use it as more of a campaign uh, speech and less so as a uh, State of the Union address. That's been his, that's been a very familiar rhetorical trope for him. His, uh, in, in a sense, he's been running for re-election ever since he got elected. So it's quite likely that he's going to return to those familiar themes. Is that pretty typical of presidents at this point in time as they're facing a re-election for a second term? Well, they typically like to sum up their accomplishments uh, and then lay out the agenda for a possible next four years. I think with this, um, with this president, we'll see the tendency to lay out those uh, accomplishments, claim them as personal victories, and then plan out something along the lines of a what a MAGA 2.0 could look like. A comeback. Who is Trump's audience here? Is it the American body politic? Is it a world stage or is it just his base? Well, um, it's the media. Politicians go on media to speak to the media and also to speak to other politicians. It's very r rarely that they go um, on media to speak to us. Um, I think in this particular case, he's making an argument um, for his presidency and then for um, uh, a potential renewal of that presidential term. Uh, often we think that uh, politicians speak to their to their voters, to their followers when they go on TV. That's actually rarely the case. They usually uh, talk, are more likely to speak directly to their opponents um, and delineate um, a space, a rhetorical space that they want to claim as their own. Now, does he need to mention impeachment, of course, with the proceedings scheduled for tomorrow, or is that best left as an elephant in the house, shall we say? <laughs> Um, he doesn't need to, he doesn't have to, and it's certainly not a very good idea to do so. Um, that said, um, this president is uh, known for having a temperament and for not being afraid to use it, so we shouldn't be surprised. But I think that would be something best left to Twitter, and that's what he's done so far, is use Twitter as the platform to um, tackle the impeachment topic. What was the tone when President Clinton gave his State of the Union address during impeachment? Um, different and similar at the same time. We're talking about two political personas that are both different, different both in terms of their politics and their rhetoric. Uh, Clinton, uh, 
also did not mention the impeachment in his State of the Union address, but had occasion to speak about uh, and address his regrets in public. Uh, that's something that we haven't seen from President Trump thus far. Uh, the defense that he's maintained is that of absolutely no wrongdoing. As you noted, Trump does address the nation directly every day. He takes to Twitter all the time. So does the State of the Union either still matter? I know we don't have a lot of time here. Should we take more seriously what he says in this speech or what he says in the raw on social media? Look, um, it's important. It always will be important. It's an event. It's a ritual. It has symbolic meaning for the country. Um, yes, sometimes it feels like more of a performance, but really it's an occasion for us to come together to reflect on who we are, who we have been in our past, who we have been, who, uh, who we can be in our future. And it's up to um, our president to also use it to lay out long-term and also short-term goals for the country. What one's the, the, the real Trump, the Twitter or the speech? Uh, it's a little bit of both. A little <laughs> bit of both. All right. And, and you know, our mayor, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, is going to be in the audience, a guest of Democratic Congresswoman Robin Kelly. But meanwhile, First District Representative Bobby Rush is going to be boycotting. How unusual is that? Not very, uh, not very unusual with this particular president. I think it's something that he's used to and that he thrives on. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if that'll serve as the trigger that everybody is uh, looking for. Right? There's been a lot of talk on Twitter, in the media, about whether uh, there's no mention of a possible impeachment uh, talk in a State of the Union address, but we'll see if we'll that see. will hold or whether he's going to ad lib. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much. Of that course, is it's a pleasure to be here. Zizi, Papa, Teresi, we really appreciate your being here. And do stick around right after the program for PBS NewsHour coverage of the State of the Union address. And now, Paris, back to you. Thank you, Amanda. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast in the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. A Chicago native who changed lives in New Zealand is now helping young people in the Chicago area. And the Senate takes its impeachment vote. We'll have the latest. And up next, the President's State of the Union, so keep it right here. And for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, pleased to give back to the community through numerous charitable initiatives.